Wake up early in the morning Hear the ding dong ring Go walk into the table See the same dumb thing Like poker on the table Nothing in my hand But if I complain about it I'm in trouble with the man Let the midnight special Shine light on me Let the midnight special Yes, better walk right And you better not stagger And you better not fight Cause the sheriff will arrest you He'll carry you down If the jury find you guilty You pay attention be bound On a midnight special Shine light on me On a midnight special Shine the devil up a light on me Yonder comes Miss Rosie How in the world do you know I can tell her by her apron And the dress she wore Umbrella on her shoulder Piece of paper in her hand Walks right up to my captain So please release my man Out of midnight special Shine light on me On a midnight special Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Glass Onion on John Lennon. And that song you just heard was Midnight Special, a classic written by Huddy Ledbetter, better known as Lead Belly, and covered by various artists including uh, Credence Clearwater Revival, that was one of them, and of course the Quarrymen, and that recording you just heard was the Quarrymen. And this is part 2 of my interview with Rod Davis. Now I'm not going to talk too much, I'm going to go to the interview very soon. Uh, just to tell you that we get into some interesting stuff about the Walton Village fate and the famous recording from that day and various other things and there's a few more myths that Rod manages to smash. So that song Midnight Special is actually about a train and uh, I wonder whether it inspired John Lennon to write uh, One After 909 which we know was one of his early ones written I believe in the late 50s and actually recorded as well in the same studio where they recorded uh, That'll Be The Day and In Spite Of All The Danger for those who've read Mark Lewison's tune-in book, you'll know that um, that's got lost. Uh, who knows whether it will surface one day, the, the quarrymen playing uh, one after nine or nine. But anyway, so on to the interview. I'll be back with a few comments at the end. And we start off, in fact, talking about the Wilton Village fate, which is where we left off last week. So here's part two of my interview with Rod Davis. Shall I give you a bit of the official version? You can tell me whether it's true or not. Should we, should we yeah. do that? So the official version, one of the things said that, uh, well, Paul tells a story that you were playing uh, Come Go With Me and John Lennon changed the lyrics to down, down, down to the penitentiary. How much truth is there in that? Well, none of us, I don't think, had part-time jobs, so we were all skint, basically. Therefore, we couldn't go out and buy either the sheet music or the record for everything we wanted. Mm. John was quite good at, at, at actually pinching records from the record shop. They were 78s, not mm. 45s, yep. uh, unlike the Nowhere Boy film. Or, or we would go into a record shop and uh, into the booth and try and scribble the words down mm. in the booth, or you'd listen to Radio Luxembourg, and of course you'd have to sit there for quite a long time before the song you wanted came up. Yeah. And... Uh, you can't get all the words down properly, even mm. in one go, can you? You know, you listen to the record once through, you can't get all the words down. Yeah. So I'd, often there were gaps in the lyrics we'd managed to, to, to pirate, you know. Mm. Even if you listen to the uh, the Del Vikings version of Come Go With Me, even mm. now, yeah. that line is very difficult to understand. It's, it's, come on, pretty baby, come and go with me. 
don't leave me baby far beyond the sea. Now, he couldn't get that. And in fact, a couple of years ago, when the Quarrymen got back together, I listened to the recording and still couldn't make out exactly what the line was. Mm. So we did a lot of stuff about trains and American, what's now Roots music stuff, mm. which became Skiffle. And so John came up with this line, down, down, down to the penitentiary. Penitentiary was a great word. It scanned, it sounded American. Absolutely. And absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the song but mm. I mean, we always sang that line so paul was sadly deceived when he thought john was improvising the lyrics so yes he did sing down 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 to the penitentiary and when the quarry men perform now we slip that line in for a laugh you know? oh yeah of course ah so you're saying he did improvise it but but so, uh, before no, he didn't, he, he, not, not at the time we he always sang down 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 to the oh, penitentiary okay. because because we couldn't get what the original line was. Oh, okay. So he, he came up with it, but not not on the day. He came up, I get not it. Spontaneously. I no, get no, it. I get it. And do you do you remember if uh, Mimi and Julia, or if both of them were there? And there, another story is that, uh, I mean, this is very specific. Forgive me if I'm trying to get you to remember incredibly specific things, but the story is that John was performing, and Mimi arrived, and he started singing lyrics about Mimi. Is it? coming down the path I've no yeah. idea I right right that. but were Mimi and Julia there do you know can you remember that I, I don't remember seeing them there but uh, okay. I'm sure they were there I mean okay. I don't remember seeing Paul McCartney then he he was obviously there as well, right so. right okay I'm, I'm afraid the, the, the memory is a bit of a blank there. <laughs> no I get it that's fine and uh, what can you remember of the set? So it's obviously come go with me. I'll talk about the recording in a second, this this famous recording that surfaced, but can you remember any of the specific set? Well, in a book called The Beatles Live, there's a photograph, an article from the Ghost and all the South Liverpool Weekly News, which actually give us half a dozen titles. Mm. And I'm sure Maggie May was in there somewhere because yeah. we liked singing the song about a prostitute, especially in, uh, when the vicar was around. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a free song of rebellion. Anything else, um, I'm sure we did Worried Man Blues, um, probably Be Bopalula, you know, so it's be a mixture of Lonnie Donigan stuff, but it was becoming more and more rock and roll group, of course, because rock right. and roll was sexier than Skiffle and Elvis was uh, sexier than Lonnie Donigan, you know. Yeah, yeah. So there was definitely uh, more and more rock and roll creeping into the set. And then, of course, uh, you said the Jeff Rind photo, this famous photo. Can we just identify you? You're behind John. So, in fact, anyone, anyone listening to this, go to Google Images and put in Quarry Men, uh, Wilton Fate, and you're behind John. You've got glasses and you're looking down very diligently at your banjo. Is that right? Well, I was, I'm not about diligently. I was extremely short-sighted. I, uh, I was minus six in my right eye, minus nine in my left eye, which is extremely blind. Yes. So a lot, most of the time I didn't actually wear my specs on stage through vanity. Mm. Uh, but um, on this occasion, I obviously was wearing my specs. I, and I was looking down at the banjo, yeah, yeah. But looking down at my fingers probably. You know, yeah. I mean, no, just to identify you, yeah. Um, behind John's right shoulder, yeah. That's right. Shirt. Okay, another story. Was John Lennon drinking slash drunk uh, that day, or can you remember that? Uh, well, as I said before, we couldn't afford to buy records. There's no way we could have afforded more than possibly one bottle of light ale, and added to that, Price Jones, the Reverend Price Jones, the vicar, would have had our guts for garters, been remotely smelling of beer. Mm. And possibly by the time Paul appeared, the half pint bottle might have been consumed by John, but there mm. was absolutely no way in front. But he might well have smelt of beer because between the afternoon and evening, he, he might have sneaked into a pub. The, there again, you see, the landlords all knew, being a fairly small place, they knew. Mm when some kid was on his way in trying to buy a bottle of something, you know. Uh, but it's not impossible that he might have somehow managed to consume a half bottle. Drunk, no. Smelling of beer, possibly. I mean, you know, Paul spent uh, God knows how many years now in show business. I mean, he, he might be encouraged to embellish his story. So like I say, we're not, not having a go at him at all. Now, this recording that came out, I mean, this absolutely blows my mind that someone would have thought to record this and that it would surface. So for people who don't know... In the 90s, somebody called Bob Molyneux. I don't know, did you know Bob Molyneux? First oh, yeah. One? Oh, you did? Okay. Well, so he was another kid from Sunday school. Ah. Uh, side of the road from me. 
Now, I'm, I'm going to be guilty of overanalyzing here, but I've always thought there's something slightly supernatural about the Beatles story. These weird coincidences. You'll know the one about Eleanor Rigby. For anyone who doesn't know, Paul wrote Eleanor Rigby in 66, and his story, and I'm not disbelieving him, he said that the Eleanor came from Eleanor Bron, who was an actress for, in Help, yeah. and Rigby's came from a shop, I think it was in Bristol. That's uh, right. Anyway, around, uh, I think it may be the 90s again, someone realised that in the grave, sorry, in the cemetery of the church fate where you guys were performing, there is a grave of Eleanor Rigby. I was there la only last week. Right, uh, right. It's, it's actually a graveyard rather than a cemetery. Ah, sorry, right, right, OK. You know, people have said to me, I should imagine John and Paul would have been, you know, you know sitting around on the graves practising their guitars. I, well, the, the vicar would have had them strung up yeah. if they'd been sitting around the graves playing the guitars. It's just mm. a, a happy coincidence. You know, Pete Shotton has told me this, exactly the same story that you've just related, that it's mm. it out of Mel and the Brom and Rigby from mm. the shop Bristol, where when they were writing the song. Yeah. Uh, however, visiting Ellen and, and Rigby's grave gives people a warm glow, fair enough. Absolutely, know? yeah. I mean, to um, me, it's possible that he... Could he have glanced at it once in his life and it, and it seeped into his head? Look, you have to not glance at it, you have to sit there and read the gravestone carefully because there's a lot of a lot of information on the gravestone. Okay. It's not immediately beside the path either. You know, it's so it's like three or four rows in. Um, I can imagine him having a quiet ciggy in the graveyard or possibly mm. uh, sneaking a half bottle of beer. But I mm. think even, even that, I think it's, you know, it's totally unlikely and just a really happy coincidence basically yeah. I, I was doing yet another podcast mm. for my my, um, my brother's daughter who is arts editor of the echo and i was mm. only listening to this podcast yesterday my mum or my mum our mother actually knew ellen rigby and she said that the woman in the song is nothing like ellen rigby she was quite a nice cheerful woman it's just a song you know and yeah. it's not about that ellen rigby anyway so yeah you know, okay Let's go back to this recording. So for people who don't know, in the 90s, um, this fellow Bob Molyneux apparently found this recording. And it's just absolutely incredible to me that someone would have recorded it and that we would have a, a, an audio record. But I wanted to ask you something about it. It's quite weird because what's been released to the public is two versions of Putting on the Style, which is Lonnie Donegan, and one version of Baby Let's Play House. But the two versions of Putting on the Style, one of them's slow and one of them's fast. I was trying to think, why would you have played two versions? I always thought that was a bit odd. You've heard it, I presume. Yeah. I have, to start with, he recorded 12 songs, and then subsequently he overdubbed, he over, over recorded. He wiped them, yeah. To his eternal regret. Mm. And uh, he, he didn't just find it. He was, he was a, he'd actually, when the Beatles became famous, he punted this recording around. He tried to contact Ringo for some reason. Why Ringo, I don't know, but Ringo wouldn't have been interested anyway. Mm. So, Rob was a policeman, and he just put it in a bank vault. And when he retired in 1995, he got it back out, and uh, it was sold at Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. And the 20-second clip was what was put out by Sotheby's to publicise the sale. Now, I had people ringing me up saying, you know, is this definitely John Lennon? Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite clearly John's voice. It's quite clearly recorded in St Peter's Church Hall because the acoustics are just terrible that you, your voice goes just goes disappears and comes back in all directions in fact it sounds as though john's sitting singing in a dustbin practically and uh so it was sold at Sotheby's for seventy nine thousand pounds they did throw in the grundig tape recorder which might have made a bit of a difference i don't know right and uh, we wrote to the quarrymen hadn't got back together at that time and we wrote to 
EMI and said, look, you know, we've got the drummer, we've got the original, all the guys that were on stage with John mm. when this recording was made, we've got the original drum kit, I've still got the original banjo, can't you take his voice off and clean it up a bit? We'll redo the backing. And uh, they wrote back saying, oh, you know, the quality is not very good, blah, blah, blah. And that was the end of that. So we've tried several times since then, because especially, you know, whenever we go to a beef convention, people say to us, you know, what's happening to the recording? Mm. And uh, <clears throat> we, we rather got the impression that probably Yoko thought, this is pure speculation, that perhaps Yoko thought the quality wasn't good enough. Mm. And uh, therefore, it wouldn't do John's um, reputation any good to be, have this put out. Whereas, you know, quite honestly, it's not going to damage his re reputation one iota, is it really? No, no. It's a historic document, and, you know, Beatles fans would be, in my personal opinion, absolutely delighted to be able to hear the thing in full. I have heard the entire recording. Oh. I was privileged to be able to listen to it, and they did try to clean it up in 1995, apparently, but the technology wasn't terribly good. I don't think it needs cleaning up because there's a lot more detail in the recording. It will be, it will be really interesting to hear it. I've heard mm. that and the whole of Baby Let's Play House. Now, the speed aspect, I never quite understood that because we did speed up anyway. I haven't sat down and really thought carefully about the speeding up business. And it does sound like two separate bits. I, you don't know what was done to the tape, whether it was played at the wrong speed. Therefore, mm. the key would be different, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know why. I mean, it's been bootlegged. The 20 seconds have been bootlegged. Mm. And in 1997, when we got back together, uh, no, it wasn't 1997, it was 2007, Whispering Bob Harris did a very good programme about 1997. Yes, yes, I've heard that, yeah. yeah. He played the 20-second clip again of, it sounded like a different 20-second clip of putting on the style, yeah. and a clip from Baby Let's Play House, which is the first time I'd heard Baby Let's Play House. So it's, mm. it is a mystery. It's such a tragedy that it buried in EMI's vaults and they won't bring it out. I don't know whether they're waiting for us all to die so they don't have to pay us any royalties. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've <laughs> said, you know, almost yeah. like sense. Put it out, we'll, we'll forego the royalties, you know, mm. the publicity would, would be worth it, which indeed it would, you know. Yeah, yeah. Such a tragedy that, that it, it exists and people can't hear the whole thing. Yeah. It's a shame. So just... And, God, Sorry, so. God. No, I was going to say, so, so what's out there at the moment that you can find is uh, something like a 20-second slow clip of Baby Let's... Of, uh, sorry, 20-second slow clip of Putting on the Style, a 20-second fast clip with some very furious drumming, very high up in the mix, and then uh, about another 20 seconds of Baby Let's Play House. So could you tell us what actually exists that they're not showing us? Both entire songs exist on tape, and the AMI have got them. Uh, okay, okay. A whole, however long it was, two minutes or whatever, both songs exist in their fullness. Okay. You know, which would be very interesting, you know, if only they would clean it up a bit and get it out. So is the entire putting on the style, is that the slow or the fast? I can't remember. Sorry, sorry. I'm okay. just saying, I think when we played, we had no sense of timing anyway, so we probably <laughs> sped up. <laughs> oh, like, I see. Sped up anyway, you know. It could be that it was a technical factor that one of the 20 second clips, whoever played it or recorded it, mm. you know, some shenanigans with the, with the tape speed or what, I don't mm. know. Mm. Um, it would be interesting to check to see if they're both in the same key, because if they're not both in the same key, then maybe there was something wrong with the tape speed when it was reproduced, I don't know. Uh, from memory, I think, I think they are in the same key. Yeah. Well, in that case, it's quite possible that mm. we sped up. Right, no. right. You were getting excited. Yeah. We were rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then another one. I think I remember um, ages ago, I, I listened to Len, because Len Gary put out a book, and there was a lovely CD that came with it. I'm not sure if you were involved with that, of him going going around Liverpool talking about things. With Pete Shop. Yeah, were you involved in that? No, I wasn't involved in it. No, uh, but I have a copy of it. Uh, that was Len and Pete, wasn't it? They were talking about this, again, I think it's a myth that, that Paul restrung John's right-handed guitar to play left-handed, and, and that seemed amazing that he'd be able to do that. Any well, ideas? I can't remember when I last listened to the CD. This is another one of these silly things. Neither mm. Len nor Pete, and well, Pete was never a guitarist. Mm. Len uses a guitar, but he, he's a bit more like the Hank Williams, you know, he's not actually playing it half the time, he's, he's singing it and holding it. 
Len would not be offended if he heard me say that because he said it to me quite a few times. I'm, I'm not a guitarist. You know, as a musician, if you change the guitar strings over the other side, you could get the first string in the slot in the nut for the sixth string, but you'd never get the sixth string in the slot for the first yes. nut. So basically, whoever dreamt that one up had no idea about guitars. So that's total rubbish. Yeah. Now, there was another story that Paul brought his guitar slung over his back, right? Mm -hmm. On his bicycle. Now, that's a theoretical possibility, yes, but... There again, just think of John and Eric. If some somebody that you didn't know suddenly turned up and wanted to completely wreck your guitar, you're going to have a gig, you know, an hour or so later. Yeah. You wouldn't let anybody touch it, would absolutely, you? Absolutely, absolutely. Never mind getting the first string in the sixth string or, whatever, or vice versa. Yeah. You wouldn't let anybody touch it because you'd be playing it later on. Now, in 2007, I was reading The Echo and there was a report in it which said Paul played the right-handed guitar upside down. And I thought, ah, that's what's happened. Because for a left-handed guitarist, the world is full of right-handed guitars. Yes. And if you want to go on somebody's guitar, yes, it's possible. I mean, I've tried doing it the other way around. Does it be possible? I thought, that's the answer. And I phoned up the Echo, and I told them who I was, and they got to speak to the journalist who wrote the article. And I said, where did this information come from? He said, oh, it came from Jeff Baker, Paul's publicist. Yes. So... Clearly, it came from Paul. Clearly, it makes eminent sense. Paul did not do, you know, the solo for 25. that big day or whatever, 20 Flight Rock, rather. Yeah. He didn't play a solo. He just played the chords. Yeah. And it's not difficult. But if I'd have been there and see, seen somebody do that, it would have stuck in my mind. I quite clearly mm. wasn't even there. Mm. But that makes sense as to what really happened. Mm. So mm. all these other theories yeah. crumbled away under the, the hard light of yeah. <laughs> fact. Don't they? I mean, obviously, that, that's a moment that's been massively overanalyzed. I mean, it was just two teenagers. But when you think of it now, do you, do you have a picture of them, of that moment when they met? Or, or is it just... I wasn't, there. I wasn't there. We were on a... This is a story which I've told many times, so it's been heard before. Hmm. We were on a QA and a in America, and uh, they said to us, now, look, all you guys are here. Now, you can tell us what really happened the moment John met Paul. Hmm. I think I was first in line. And I said, well, I don't even remember seeing Paul McCartney at all that day. And I probably went home for me tea. I probably dropped, we walked, I think we walked over from the field to the church hall, which is on the other side of the road, and left our instruments there for the, you know, evening performance. We were, we were playing the interval spot in the dance. And I probably went home for me tea. And that didn't get any reaction. So mm. next time, for, for sheer devilment, I said, oh, I must have gone for a pee at the most exciting moment in rock and roll. <laughs> Snigger, you see, like it did off you. Yeah, yeah. And a friend, an American friend of ours, emailed me and said, I've done this acrylic painting of the moment John met Paul. On it, you can see Ivan Vaughan introducing Paul to John. All the other guys in the body men are there in the picture. But uh, you aren't. Uh, your banjo's leaning on a chair. But I was there when you said that you were in the bathroom at the time. You see, mm. now that picture is now on the wall of St. Peter's Church Hall. Uh, right. so that's that has now become a myth, a little myth in its own right. That Rod Davis, the, his bladder let him down at the most exciting moment of rock and roll history, <laughs> but it's complete and utter fabrication. It uh, stems entirely from my stupid joke that I went for a pee at the time John was introduced to Paul. I don't remember meeting him at that time at all. Okay. But either during the afternoon, not at all on that day. I met him a week or two later. That's that one. But there aren't angels blowing trumpets peeking out from behind clouds at that moment or anything. Somebody mm. we knew met somebody we didn't know. Yeah. Big, big. It was exactly. obviously important for John and Paul, but not for the rest of them. Mm. Is there anything else from that day, or should we, should we move on? Nothing That's particularly bit... significant from that day, no. Yeah. Uh, apparently on the way home, I've heard this from Pete's own lips, and you probably mm. read it anyway, that John said, I immediately saw Paul's talent and immediately offered him no, he didn't. Mm. Pete and John walked home together because they lived very near. And mm. John said to Pete, what did you think of Ivan's friend, you know, mm. uh, John? And Pete said, well, yeah, yeah, he's okay, yeah, pretty good. Mm. And John said, well, maybe we should ask him to join the group because he, mm. he could play proper guitar chords and he knew a lot of words and all, they were very good currency, you know. Mm. Um, so that was when the decision was made. But Pete, a week, a week or so later was walking out of his house. He lived just along the road from Ivan, who was a schoolmate of Paul McCartney's. 
Paul was probably cycling along to Ivan's house to go and visit him. Mm-hmm. And uh, Pete said, oh, by the way, he's, you know, hi, Paul. By the way, we were thinking of asking you to join the group. And that's when he joined. So we were talking between the 6th of July and the 29th of July. Okay. Because my dad's passport of us entering France is stamped Boulogne 29 July. And I met Paul at Aunt Mimi's when we were practicing there. The only time I remember practicing at Mimi's, our friends used to come and listen to the rehearsals, you see. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we didn't mind. It gave us something to bounce it off. Or bounce it off. Sometimes they brought young ladies with them or one thing or another. Mm-hmm. And uh, I turned up and there was this lad there I didn't know. So I said, who's this, John? Oh, he said, this is Paul. He's come to listen to us practice. So mm-hmm. obviously by that time, he'd been offered to join the group and had agreed. But John didn't tell me because... Basically, the group left me and I faded out of it, so they weren't going to tell me that Paul was going to take the banjo player's slot. Okay. Now, let's talk about uh, Aunt Mimi and about uh, Julia. So, again, I'll I'll tell you what I've heard and what uh, have been put in books. Actually, before I do that, um, there is one book I just wanted to recommend, maybe you'd recommend it, called The Day John Met Paul. Have Have you ever read that one? Oh, yes. Would you recommend that? It's written by an American friend of mine, um, and he spent ages and ages on the phone with me, this is pre-email time, transatlantic phone calls, trying to get the detail right. Of course, he's had to expand it into a very uh, into a story by putting a lot more extra detail in it. I think he's captured the atmosphere very well. I mean, there are, there are certain things in there, I, I can't remember exactly at the moment, which, which I would disagree with, but I actually had the opportunity, I forgot his name, Jim... O'Donnell, is it? Jim O'Donnell. Jim right. O'Donnell, yeah. uh, Jim asked me to do a talking book version of it. He said, mm. who am I going to get? You know, some English actor doing a Scouse accent or something, or would I rather have somebody who was actually there at the time with his genuine accent? So yeah. I got the job, and I had to do the bridging myself. Well, it meant that to get it down into a reasonable length, I had to cut out most of the incidental stuff like what was going on in America at the time yeah, kind of thing. You yeah, know? Yeah. All that we were able to cut out and concentrate on the basic story. It's an interesting book. My brother said he captured the atmosphere. It's not a you know 100% accurate documentary, but it's, mm. it's pretty good. As a fan, I would say that capturing the atmosphere might be more important than uh, small details. But, yeah, I mean, if you want yeah. accuracy, Hunter Davis's book about the Quarrymen that was published in 2002 mm. is probably the most accurate because we were going to do a book ourselves mm. and we happened to meet Hunter in Cuba and cut a long story short, we eventually said to him, look, why don't we give all our stuff to you and you can write it? So that is about 95% accurate. What, what about Nowhere Boy? Have you seen, have you seen that? What would you uh, say about oh, yes. that? In, in 2010, we mm. did um, a three-week tour of the States in conjunction with the film. We were going to have a tour of the States anyway at that time, mm. and it turned out that we knew the man who was in charge of the publicity for it, an okay. English guy called Martin Lewis. So that's what happened. Basically, they would show the film, then we would do a Q&A, and then we would do a, a one-hour set afterwards. And the first question was inevitably, how accurate is the film? Mm. We eventually developed an answer which went something like this. Well, come on, we all know John Wayne won World War II (laughs) single-handed. This is a film. It's not historical. It's not a documentary. And therefore, it would be very unfair of us to criticise it as if it was a documentary. Mm. And then we would proceed for the next half an hour to criticise it as though it was a documentary because I think that's what Beatles fans were expecting, something which was very, very close to the truth. Mm. But, I mean, basically it's a film. A film director, when they get hold of a book, do not put the book on the screen faithfully. They have to put themselves into it, otherwise why are they there? If they were documentary filmmakers, that would be different, but Sam Taylor Wood is not a documentary filmmaker Mm. and she therefore had to put a lot of her own ideas into the film. Yeah. I mean, uh, just to name but one, to start with, there's a bunch of lads in the toilets at Quarry Bank mm. and said, I'm going to start a rock and roll group. Well, it wasn't a rock and roll group. The word skiffle hardly appeared in the entire film, which, mm. which is a total, in itself, is a total travesty of the truth. You know, mm. I wasn't there when he started the group. Two or three other people, he said to Nige Wally, who was there, uh, and you can be the manager. Mm. Nice didn't even go to Quarry Bank. So, I mean, that scene is, you know, I mean, the general feel of it was good. You know, yeah. there was a lot of good stuff in it. But as soon as you get mm. below the board headlines, it, there's little or no relation 
the truth, unfortunately. Right. Which is a great shame. A great shame, because that's what people were expecting. But, I mean, from what you've told me about John Lennon today, I mean, I, I think the guy, is Aaron Johnson, he uh, seemed John to do Lennon. a pretty good job. Oh, yes, say? yes. I'm, I'm not complaining mm. about the acting. I mean, Aunt right. Mimi was brilliant. I mean, uh, mm. Julia was brilliant. I, I didn't really know Mimi at all, but Julia was very good. I'm not talking about the acting. I'm talking about yeah. the, the actual situation. There was John down by the Liverpool docks because of this uh, idea that Liverpool sailors who were on the transatlantic boats brought records back. Well, yeah. I'm sure they did. Mm. But to start with, they weren't bringing 45s back because 45 has only really got going about 1957. And John was pinching 78 records from the record shop in Walton, and you didn't stick a 78 down your trousers because it was shellac and you'd have been singing soprano before you know where you were <laughs> if you'd done that. We went to the premiere in New York. We met Yoko, we met the scriptwriter, who mm. was from Liverpool. He asked me what I thought of it, and I said, well, what was all that stuff about riding on the top of a bus? What the hell was that all about? He said, well, in Pete Shorten's book, they talk about a tree being near the side of the road, hmm. just along, along from John's house, and kids swinging out in front of a double-decker bus on a rope hmm. and swinging back in again, as you know, missing the bus. Well, that's true. Hmm. That really happened. I mean, I've seen it happen. Hmm. He said, but we didn't have any rights to Pete's book, so we thought we couldn't use that, so we thought we'd invent something else. So that okay. riding on top of the bus was just... Just an invention of the scriptwriter. Mm. Because obviously, scriptwriters have got to invent dialogue, they've got to invent invent situations, and, uh, you know, that's what a film is all about, really. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying, really, is that's a lot more forgivable than, than putting it in a documentary or a book, really, isn't it? Uh, well, it's, it's forgivable, yeah. but unfortunately, yeah. I think Beatles fans were expecting something which was much more accurate. They mm. were expecting a drama documentary, I think mm. they're called, aren't they? Which was as close to the, quote, accepted truth, unquote, mm. uh, as possible. I mean, you would have had Paul swapping the guitar strings around, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that could have been equally... I mean, I think I've got about four pages of A4 typescript of things which were definitely inaccurate. OK. Mm. But uh, as a film, it was good. With regard to Backbeat, uh, Pete Best is supposed to have said, oh, it's a great film, but <laughs> absolutely... Mm. Nothing to do with the truth, you know, which is, yeah. which is to film, you know. I felt actually, yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously I wasn't there, but I, I felt Backbeat was much more kind of Hollywoodized than uh, Nowhere Boy. Nowhere Boy seemed to have a sort of down-home feel about it, which seemed yeah, to work. Yeah, it had a nice, a nice feel about yeah. it, but as, yeah. as soon as you start putting it under not even a microscope, mm. even, even a cheap magnifying glass, <laughs> I'm afraid most of it is, bears very little relationship to the truth. All right. So you said you didn't, you never knew Aunt Mimi. So let, let's just talk about Julia Lennon because she, she's a figure that absolutely fascinates me. I must say. Is there anything you could tell us about her that hasn't been said before? That's, I know it's a bit of a, that's a tricky I task know, after all. No, not really. I'll tell you what I've said before many times. That she, um, obviously, she taught John and, and Eric these banjo chords. I don't ever remember seeing Julia with her own banjo. She's supposed to have had a, a banjo which has had a mother of pearl back on it, according mm. to. Her daughter Julia, and I've still spoken to Julia some, at some length about this banjo. Mm. I don't ever remember her bringing her banjo out, whereas I have a clear recollection of this. She saying to me when we got down there, Oh, I hate those horrible guitars. Well, they were horrible guitars, they were cheap and nasty. Mm. Right? My banjo was a 1920s job, it wasn't exactly star quality. It was mm. still fairly cheap, but compared with the guitars, it was actually an upmarket instrument. She mm. said, oh, give me your banjo, or give me your banjo. I hate those horrible guitars. And she would play my banjo, and I have a, a mm. mental picture of her standing with her back to the fireplace playing my banjo. She was more like a big sister to John rather than the mother. That's the way it came over in the film. Yeah. And she was, um, you know, totally encouraging. And again, my parents were totally encouraging of us as well, you know. Mm. I haven't got really anything more to say except she was a very nice lady and she lets practice in their bathroom. Okay. <laughs> well, I think Mark Lewison actually smashed another myth, which was that the guy that ran her over was drunk. Yes, mm. he, he was a police officer who was off duty but hadn't actually got the driving license, apparently. He was uh. still driving on a provisional license. I think the problem was that in front of Mimi's house, if you go there today, there's a strip of grass. Now, that was where two lines of the tram track used to be when we had trams. The trams finished in 1957. 
Mm. So the tram track was sort of protected by these tall hedges on either side of the track. And somebody said to me, there was a, a bus just arriving at Mimi's bus, uh, not Mimi's bus stop, the bus stop that Julia was trying to get the bus from. Yeah. Right? She was probably concentrating on the bus and watching the bus, you know, trying to make sure she got on it before it pulled out. And she popped through a slot in the hedge mm-hmm. straight onto the, the main road. And if the guy had been driving in the right-hand half of the road, neither of them would have had a chance. Oh, I see. And that seems to me to be... I, I had never thought about the business of the, the bus arriving at the bus stop. Mm-hmm. I had just envisaged Mimi stepping through the hedge and I couldn't understand why she wasn't looking. Oh, Julia, you mean, sorry, Julia. Julia, yeah. 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 I can't imagine, I, I could only imagine her stepping through the gap in the hedge, mm. because it was a six-foot-high hedge, you know, so she would have been completely concealed until she stepped through the gap. And I can't imagine why she would have stepped through the gap and not looked to the left to see if there's any traffic coming, right? Yeah, it's only said, look, If there's, there was a bus, pull, the bus she wanted had just pulled up at the bus stop, which was over to the right, Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's quite possible that her, this is all conjecture on my part, of course, yeah, yeah, it's quite yeah. possible that her attention was diverted to the right, to the bus, and she didn't see the car coming from the left. Oh, I see. And, and it, again, if the guy had been on the left-hand side of the carriageway, you know, the, the left-hand half of, of his part of the carriageway, because it's a dual carriageway, if he'd been on the left-hand half, you know, near the kerb, mm-hmm. far side of the road, it would never have happened. Oh, I see. Yeah. So possibly, if he was coming along the hedge side for whatever reason, maybe he'd seen the bus at the bus stop. There, yeah, another another possible point. He'd seen the bus at the bus stop. Therefore, had pulled out to the the right hand side so he could go past the bus. Oh, I that see. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, makes yeah. Sense. Okay. It's uh, exactly what happened, but it's certainly one possible theory. Mm. Yeah. I think uh, some of the confusion with uh, about him being drunk was actually... Do you remember this from Mark Lewison's book? I think it was two weeks before... You know, Bobby Dykins, who was her boyfriend, John Dykins. Yes, indeed. I believe he was, was convicted of drink driving That's along right. the same stretch of road. Let me have a look at my notes, uh, Rod. Just give me two seconds. Yeah. When I read the Lewison book, I've actually made, made a note of some of the strange coincidences. OK, here we go. Let me read a note I made from Mark Lewison's book. In the summer of 1958, Brian Epstein was involved in another rough trade case a few days before Julia Lennon's mother's lover, Bobby Dykins, crashed his car near Mendips while drunk. Both cases were tried at the same court, and Dykins' solicitor was Rex Makin, friend and neighbour of Brian Epstein's family. So yeah. basically, Julia Lennon's boyfriend crashed his car near Mendips, and his lawyer was Brian Epstein's lawyer. There's a weird coincidence. Yeah. Of course, Julia herself would be hit by a car and killed in Walton very close by and only two weeks later in time to her lover's crash. John's probably false recollection that the policeman who knocked over Julian was drunk may have come from the Dykins incident. So that seems to make sense. It could make sense, yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there was anything about drunkenness in, with, with regard to the policeman. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it's court case records, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you OK to go for a bit longer? Yeah, sure. I should be preparing my English class, but I'd rather talk to you, to be honest. So. Welcome. Yeah, OK. My, son, my wife ringing me up shortly to say, can I collect it from the hairdressers, but go out to work. All right, yeah. What g- glamorous lives we lead, eh? Let's edit it out, can't you? <laughs> so uh, you live in London now. When did you actually leave uh, Liverpool? Oh, 68. A 68. long time ago. I've been teaching for a couple of years, from 64 to 68. Hmm. And uh, by Christmas 67, I thought, well, I, I need to do something a bit more exciting. I resigned from my teaching French and Spanish mm. and tried to find something more interesting without immediate success. There didn't seem to be anything in Liverpool. Even in desperation, I decided to apply to see if I could work on the production line at Fords. Mm. But then I, I had a beard and I was probably... A, to them, a bearded student activist who was going to upset mm. the production, so I certainly mm. didn't get in the Ford. I found an interesting job as a um, locust control officer in Saudi Arabia, driving around the desert. I didn't get that. There was another one editing a, a petroleum magazine based in London. Mm. And then the one I did get was driving around Europe with a minibus with a bunch of tents. Now, mm. I did French and Spanish at university, 
I lived in Germany for a year, so I could speak a fair bit of German. Mm. And when I was at university, they sent me to Romania for a month on a Romanian language course because it, I, I was doing Romance Philology, as it's called. Mm -hmm. So this particular company would fly people back and forth from Romania. So it was very useful to have somebody turn up who actually could speak a bit of Romanian. Not very much, but enough to impress the locals. Mm. So the first trip was to drive up through Europe, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Leningrad, Moscow, Kiev, Odessa, Romania. That was mm. three weeks. And then they flew back because Romania, the Black Sea resorts, were tourist destinations for British holidaymakers. So there was a company that had chartered a jet you know, from England mm. to Romania, and we bought a few seats from them, and our passengers flew in and out of Romania. So that's the job I did. I, they, I then picked them up in Romania, drove through Bulgaria to Istanbul, and then Ephesus, Troy, and I did that sort of thing for the whole of 1968. And then I ended up behind a desk organizing things for this particular company who were based on King, in Kingston-on-Thames. So that's why I ended up in the south of England, because that's okay. where the company was. If anybody says, why did you leave Liverpool? I said, because I couldn't find an interesting job. And what was your contact? So you left the Quarrymen in 57. What was your contact with the Beatles? Did you just suddenly see them on TV, or had you been following their well, progress? the last time I saw John uh, was in, I think it was Easter 62, because okay. uh, I was at university in Cambridge, and their rag day every year was the same as Poppy Day. Yeah. And somebody had decided to get up a jazz band and mm -hmm. make a record on Decca, which we did, and uh, I was playing a banjo on it. Yeah. And um, so I, I met John in Liverpool outside, bumped into him in the street in Clayton Square opposite, uh, outside Owen Owens, mm -hmm. and I was saying, so I, I think I must have beaten you onto record. I was, uh, then I subsequently discovered that Polydor recording had actually been made probably in July. My Decca one was in, Nove in the November, but yeah. he was saying to me things like, you know, well, well, what are you doing now? So I was telling him, he said, what are you playing? So I said, well, I'm really in, into the folk music society and uh, I'm playing fiddle and banjo and mandolin and guitar and I'm into bluegrass music. Mm -hmm. he, he said, oh, I pity you can't play the drums because you could come to Hamburg and play drums with us. Now, I think this was a necessarily a serious offer. <laughs> right, but, right. And not, strangely enough, I'd actually forgotten that part of the conversation. I remembered the business about the record, but my sister, who was eight years younger than me, said, because uh, my sister was still living at home at the time, my mother was saying, he's not going to Hamburg with that Lennon. Ah, uh, right. Still saying that, yeah. <laughs> I have escaped Lennon's baleful influence. Well, she didn't want me to leave uh, Cambridge University halfway through my course throw my degree up to go and play the banjo with Lennon and all the guitar with Lennon in Hamburg. Absolutely. But, uh, that was the last and the last time I met John. So the day the Beatles played in Cambridge, I remember seeing queues of young girls queuing up to buy tickets. Mm. But that particular day they were playing, we had a friend, some friends who had a bluegrass club in Newmarket, and they, with their group, which ran the club, they had a booking elsewhere, so they couldn't be there for their own club night. So mm. we... Well, my friends went over to Newmarket and played their club. So I never actually saw the Beatles mm. at all. And, uh, of course, people keep asking me, did I remember so-and-so, all these beat groups from Liverpool? I was not, not interested in beat groups. What happened was that, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, that I had a, a recording of Burl Ives singing Worried Man Blues, Yep. which a friend of my dad had given to me. And sometime later... I was in the Phillips Son and Nephew bookshop in Whitechapel in Liverpool and I saw on the shelf the Burl Live songbook and I picked it up, looked at it and there were quite a few of the songs which had been skiffled up, you know. Mm. And it also explained in the notes that a lot of these songs had come from the British Isles anyway. So anyway, I bought the book and I started playing these songs and I got really interested in the blues. Well, I'd already been interested in blues anyway, but the folk music side of what was, again, roots music, so by the time I got to university, I was playing quite a few songs from this Burl Ives songbook. I went to the Folk Song Society there, and a lad said to me, oh, you're from Liverpool, have you ever been to the Spinners? I said, what's the Spinners? He was from Liverpool, it turned out he was the boyfriend of the daughter of our maths teacher from Quarry Bank. So I went to the Spinners, and of course there was a whole folk scene in Liverpool, which is totally swamped by the rock and roll scene mm. and people memories, as indeed is the country scene. You know, there was a big country music scene in Liverpool as well. Mm. So I, I got involved in the folk scene. 
So I had no reason to go to the cavern or anything like that. I just wasn't interested in that. It wasn't my kind of music, basically. Mm. My only other little connection is I used to go to the Jacaranda. Oh, yeah, Alan Williams. Yeah. Yeah. I've still got my Jacaranda membership card uh, with Beryl Williams' initials on the back of it. Jacaranda was interesting because there were quite a couple of nurses' homes around the Jacaranda. Mm -hmm. And nurses, of course, would be working shifts. So you go to another dance, a normal dance, and the girls would want to go home at 10 o'clock at night. Whereas if you went to the Jacaranda, they could still be dancing at 2 o'clock in the morning mm. because they were working shifts, you see. That's why a lot of young men like myself would go to the Jack. Mm. Uh, but that was when I was at home from university. You know. So there we go. So I, I, that was my only contact with John. I mentioned when I met Paul in 1957 briefly at Mimi's. Then I also met him in 2005. Okay. Do you want to hear about that? Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, I do a lot of windsurfing, windsurfing competitions, racing. And uh, every year there used to be a competition in Brighton, or rather at Hove. And Paul is supposed to have had this beach house by Hove Marina. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year we thought, will we ever see McCartney? Anyway, one year we were waiting for the wind to blow. It was a lovely sunny morning. And we were all sitting on the promenade there, waiting with our kit, all ready to go. And a friend of mine said, I've just seen Paul McCartney walking along with his dog. So there was a sort of a sunken garden behind the promenade. So I thought, well, I'll just dodge around and see if I can find him. Anyway, I walked down the stairs into the sunken garden. And there was a fellow with a hoodie on and a scruffy dog talking to two of the officials from the windsurfing competition. Mm. And they know me, my one claim to fame. And they said, hey, Ron, look who this is. So I walked over and shook hands with Paul. And uh, he said, you know, who are you then? So I said, oh, I'm the, the bloke you replaced in the quarry man. <laughs> so he said, oh, well, that's going back a bit. Mm -hmm. What happened? Did I elbow you aside? I said, well, no, I was a banjo player. And it was becoming a rock and roll group. And of course, you can't be a banjo player in a rock and roll group. I didn't like rock and roll anyway. Uh, he said, well, you must have been there the day I first met John, the, the garden fake. So I said, yeah, I'm in behind John's right shoulder mm -hmm. in the famous photograph. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then the windsurfing guys started asking him if, if he'd ever tried windsurfing. They were trying to persuade him to present the prizes for the event. And, uh, he said, well, he tried it, but he didn't like it. He preferred dinghy sailing. And his son quite enjoyed windsurfing. He said to them, is he any good, meaning me? Like, <laughs> unfortunately, I wasn't having a very good weekend anyway. Yeah. I wouldn't have got a prize, but Paul had to leave because he said, oh, I, I won't be here by the end of the event. I've got to go back to London. I've got to go away or something. Yeah. So... Then his dogs started getting uh, impatient and, and, uh, and off he went. <laughs> so that was the only time I actually met Paul. Okay. Uh, you know, apart from the few minutes in 1957. Hmm. All right. Um, like I said, I could probably talk to you for hours, but uh, I, I really want to take this opportunity. Just say thanks a lot for doing this, first of all. And can you tell us about the Quarrymen revival? You told me it was 2007. And please plug the group and I will put links to your website and everything. So... Go for that. <laughs> well, that's great. Actually, it was 1997, the Cavern's oh, okay. 60th birthday, that we got together. 2007 was, was some, something else I mentioned. And uh, okay. we, we, there had been one or two false starts. And then in 1997, we were invited to the Cavern's 60th birthday party. Mm -hmm. And it was free booze all day. <laughs> and uh, by about 6 o'clock in the evening, we decided we'd better go and eat something. And they said, no, you can't go now. There's a TV crew coming who wants to film you. And they want you on stage playing. Well, I always played, so it wasn't a problem for me. But Eric didn't even own a guitar. And, of course, we hadn't been together almost 40 years. Hmm. Anyway, they got us on stage. There was no drumsticks. Colin played the drums with his hand. There was a, a Lennon lookalike, a McCartney lookalike. <laughs> and we staggered our way through a couple of numbers. But they, they said, well... It doesn't matter because the the audience has been drinking solid for the last four hours, six hours. They're all legless. They won't notice anyway if you are rubbish. Yeah. Anyway, some of the people in the audience who are Beatles fans in Liverpool, particularly a lady called Jean Catherall, said they were going to try and recreate the 40th anniversary of the day John met Paul. Were we up for it? Ultimately, we said yes. And so that's how we got back together. Oh, there was right. a one-off in, in, in aid of the fabric of St Peter's Church Hall, which needed re repairing. Mm. And then someone said, have you got a CD? So we thought we'd better go out and make a CD. Mm. And on the strength of that, you know, we've been invited all over the world. <laughs> and now there's only three of the 
absolute original guys left. Right. Eric Griffiths, the guitar player, died in 2005. Okay. Pete Shotton died in 2017. The original drummer, Colin. The original TGS bass player, Len Gary, who plays guitar and sings now, and myself. Since 2005, we've had John Dufflo, who played on In Spite of All the Danger. Yeah, that's right, yeah. That would be the day playing the piano for us from time to time. However, John's having trouble with his hands now, so he finds difficulty playing, so he's actually taking a, very much a back seat these days. In fact, mm. he's not really doing any gigs with us at the moment. Mm. And then, as we never had a permanent bass player, we used to borrow bass players from wherever we went. You know, usually with a beat convention, or loads of Beatles look-alike, sound-alike bands, and the bass player was very happy to add playing with the Quarrymen to his CV. But um, a couple of years ago at the Casbah, we met Chaz Newby, who played with the Beatles for a whole month, bass player, That's left-handed right. electric bass. That's right. And the, when the Beatles uh, left Hamburg for the first time, Stuart stayed with Astrid, and uh, they came back to Liverpool and they had three or four gigs lined up, but no bass player, because at the time Paul hadn't started playing the bass. Hmm. And Pete Best said, well, look, as a mate of mine I knew at school, I used to play rugby with him, who plays the bass, we'll get him in. So this is Chaz Newby, like left-handed bass. And he played three or four gigs with them, including the famous Litherland Hall one, where everybody stopped dancing and came and clustered around the stage and just stirred and listened to the band. Hmm. And then said to him, why don't you come back and play in Hamburg with us? And he said, well, I've got a scholarship from Pilkington Glass. They pay me while I'm a student. They pay me while I'm on holiday. Mm. You know, it's just fantastic. Mm. Why should I come back to Hamburg? <laughs> I don't think he said, and live in a toilet with you guys, but that's virtually what they were doing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So jazz plays bass with us. So there's, there are four of us at the moment. Wow, uh, wonderful. Active. Oh, so you're, you're touring at the moment, are you? How, how regularly yeah. do you play at the moment? Well, I think the word touring is something of an overstatement. I mean, right. we have toured, as I say, in America with Nowhere Boy, we did 17 gigs in 21 days all over America, which, which was serious touring, you know. Oh. Um, we tend to do the odd weekends in Europe and, and this sort of thing, you know. In fact, I've been in Spain three times this year. Oh. Um, the Quarantine played in Valle de Lille in November. I did something on the Costa Brava in July. Mm because I, I give a talk about the origins of the Quarrymen and Skiffle in Spanish with music and digital slides, you know. I mm. played a guitar at the appropriate moment. And I also did something on a cruise out of Barcelona in oh. uh, October. So um, we could probably get to Spain at the moment more often than we get anywhere else. To right. Well, if you ever come to Madrid or anywhere nearby, you've got to look me up. And, uh... We will do that. Yeah. 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 I played in Madrid. By the way, Rod, do you mind uh, do you mind me asking you your age? You're seventy-seven. Yeah, I must say you're looking very good. I'm not, I'm not just saying that, honestly. And you're very articulate. So. When did you last go to spec sales? <laughs> <laughs> oh, another joke. No. no the but uh, it looks like you're going to be sticking around for a while. Eh? I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I intend to do my damnedest. I tell you. All okay. Right. Well, it's been been nice talking to you, Anthony. Yeah. I hope this uh, some use to you. You don't have to beat your brains out too much doing the editing. So I'm going to sign off the podcast. Just stay on Skype if you can, just for yeah. a minute when we finish. Yeah. All right, so thanks for doing this, and uh, we'll keep in touch, and I'll let you know when it's uh, out. Thank you very much. Great. All right, thanks a lot. So that was Rod Davis, ex and current Corey man. Um, thanks a million to him for talking to me. He was a very, very nice guy. We had a nice conversation and uh, got lots of good information out there as well. So I'm basically signing off now. I uh, did ask last week for uh, questions, listener questions. Not so much uh, quiz questions of the type, but uh, things for discussion. And particularly anything with a psychological angle to it. It doesn't have to be, though. I think also on the Facebook page, I may have already uh, posted this, but uh, I wanted to recommend a video basically made by a YouTuber from uh, Available Clips. And it's called Lennon McCartney Never Apart. The channel actually is called Breathless 345. I just discovered it by accident and made some great videos about John and Paul and their ever-changing and evolving relationship. So you can hear the music going there and I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.